and trust that the Lord will glorify himself as we look again in the book of Mark chapter number 6. We're looking at a desert place and seeing how the Lord brought it about that they were brought there. This is not a desert like uh, nothing but sand and rattlesnakes and scorpions. This is a deserted place because there's much grass here. It's just a place where others do not inhabit and this is a place where Jesus called his disciples to go forth to be able to have a meal. I think he fully intended and fully ordained that they eat when the people ate. It is about eating. In verse number 21 of Mark chapter 6, and when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made, listen, a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. It's about eating for verse 31 says, and he said unto them, the apostles that came back from their evangelistic trip, come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while for there were many coming and going for they had no leisure so much as to eat. It's about eating for, in verse number 35, the disciples say this is a desert place. The time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, give ye them to eat. That's the third time to eat has been mentioned. And they say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them again to eat. I want to talk about three meals just for a little while. In verse number 21, there was Herod's supper. It reminds me of the, uh, the orgy that was had over in the book of Daniel when the handwriting on the wall appeared. And we see that in that orgy in Daniel, Daniel had to be called, he wasn't there. And in this supper, John the Baptist wasn't there. He was down in prison. And we understand that this is just a natural meal. First Corinthians chapter six, if you will, verse 12 and 13. First Corinthians six and verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. This is the Christian's attitude. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. That's natural. That's the way it is. But God shall destroy both it and them. The belly and the meats. Now the, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Chapter 8, if you will, in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 8. But meat contend, commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. The meat offered to idols by the idolatrous heathen does not affect the Christian. He said it's not that which goes into the body that defiles it, it's that which comes out. Blasphemies, and lying, slanders, so forth. And so we see that the meat is necessary, it's needful, uh, and, and yet uh, if it's out of order, it is something that brings upon it a judgment of God. If I were to ask you in, Ma in Matthew chapter 24, open book test if you want it, verse 37 through 39, give me uh, an earmark of that which the day of Noah was like. Eating and drinking. Eating and drinking. Anything wrong with that? No, it's not that what they were doing, it's what that leaves out. Married and given in marriage, God's not mentioned. They're satisfying essentially and exclusively the natural 
desires. God's not in it at all. He said, that's how the world will be when the Lord comes back. Be a good day for the Lord to come back today, wouldn't it? So eating and drinking is apart from recognizing God is, is that which shows man's desire for satisfaction of his natural lust and wants. And it, it can be that which shows that it is a sinful day. So we see, dear soul, that uh, Herod and his men got together. He called them together for a supper. And as I said this morning, the thing that resulted from this supper was they get carried away. They've already eaten everything, tasted everything. They've drank the wines, tasted of the delicacies, the desserts and all of that. And they're kind of looking at one another and said, what's next? So Herod, trying to top what he's already done, gets his wife Herodias to call, call her daughter in and have her dance for him. Well, when you start satisfying the lust of the flesh, especially in eating and drinking and so forth, you, you, you get dull in every other way and you get excited about things that you really ought not get excited about. And so he lets his mouth overload him and says, all the men liked it, you know, and they, hey, yeah, pretty, nice looking girl, right? Yeah, you know. And so he said, yeah, I, I did this. I just, it's something I did. I'm going to show you how great I am. You can have half my kingdom if you'll name it. She said, hold on a minute. She run and asked her mother, and her mother said, John the Baptist, I've been trying to get to him and trying to kill him. Uh, verse 19, then therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, against John, listen, and would have killed him, but she could not. She couldn't get to him. But it was this supper that provided her with the opportunity to be able to do what the devil had placed in her heart from the very beginning. Herod and Herodias had said, hey, babe, you divorce your husband, I'll divorce my wife and we'll get together. And so th they did. And her husband was Herod's brother. So John being of the law and being lawful, he said, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. That made her mad. So this anger smoldered in her heart until she could find an opportunity to be able to get somebody to kill John for her, and here it was. You would think that just eating and drinking would not be anything harmful in it. But the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, that would be an earmark of the devastating condition of man in the days of Noah, and it would be also repeated in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So man's appetites getting away from them will always cause the spiritual man uh, to be destroyed and, and, and to be killed. So, uh, you know, in here, I don't know how long Herod lived after this, but I couldn't find a record of Herod ever having another meal in the Bible. I didn't say Herod didn't have another meal. Of course he ate every day. But as far as the issue of God is concerned, and it being inscribed on the pages of God's inspired word, we don't ever hear of Herod having an, another meal. Second meal, if you look at John chapter 6, <clears throat> this event in Mark 6 is one of those few things that appears in every one of the Gospels, in all four of the Gospels. It is in Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. In John 6, in verse number 4, listen what it says. 
And the Passover, a feast, did you get that? And, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to feed in verse 37 of Mark 6. He said, you give them to eat. Don't send them away. You give them to eat. He's going to give 5,000 men, plus women, plus children, plus the 12 apostles and himself, enough food for them to be sustained till they've had their fill. You don't have to stop eating until you've had your fill. You know, we, we've been in meetings and they say, come to the church members, y'all go light on the chicken, we're about to run out, let the visitors have it. Didn't have to say that. Everybody eat all they want. Twelve basketfuls left over. What is that picture? And it says, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And I look about look up about the Passover in Exodus chapter twelve, and I begin to see that there is eating. There is redemption. There's the blood being shed and the lamb being killed. And I believe that this time that the Passover was not at hand, Herod has had his supper. We find to eat, to eat, to eat, to eat in your Bible. That the issue of God here was bringing us from a consciousness of the physical food and meats for the belly and belly for the meats. Everybody understands that. We know that. But meats do not commend us to God. It is the bread that brings us God within us. It is the bread that brings God within us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here we have a picture of the Lord feeding everybody that was there. Nobody was left hungry. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. The Passover is nigh, dear soul. The Lamb of God has been slain. God has been satisfied, and so has the law. All sins have been purged. Justification took place when Jesus said, It is finished. And then individual redemption is accomplished as it is applied to the individual by faith. And so here we have the Lord Jesus Christ providing himself. We're not going to go to the grocery store. There's no time. It's too late in the day. The Bible said that Jesus died at the end time. That's what marked the time of the end was the cross. And so it was late in the day and God Almighty provided himself a sacrifice and provided himself as the Lamb of God, provided himself as the bread of heaven, the bread of life. And he gave himself, and no one had to go anywhere to get anything. It was already there. What a blessed thing. We need to be temperate in our eating and learn a lesson from Herod. But we need, we need to be extravagant in our feasting off of Christ. We need to understand that a blessed thing is to be hungry. The amazing thing to me when you look up the word soul and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and he became Man doesn't have a soul. He is a soul. Man became a living soul. Look up that word soul and it will, you will see it will lead you to the Hebrew word appetite. Man became a living appetite. Why would he want man to be appetite except that God is bread to begin with? 
the Passover, a feast, was nigh. And that's when this happened. And the Lord Jesus, sick of religion, desirous of spiritual communion and intercourse with his church, provides himself as the bread. Dear soul, God's going to feed you with Herod's food time after time. You're going to have the natural food. Indulge in it too much and the spiritual man will die. Get too involved in it and you'll give those with secret hatreds and murderous hearts opportunity to kill out the spiritual man. But oh, dear soul, that appetite in the natural will bring you to a place to where you begin to understand and perceive that as I have a, a hunger for natural food, a thirst for water to supply that which I need and to quench that thirst, it's such a blessed thing to have a cool drink of water when you're hot and parched and perspiration is almost making you blind as the salty sweat gets in your eyes. And to have a cool drink of water, stand in the shade for a few minutes is a blessed thing. And, but how blessed is it if you don't come to Christ in that? And the Passover, a feast, was very near. Go into a, desert, a deserted place. We have nothing for them to eat. Yes, you do. Give ye them to eat. If you've got Christ, you've always got everything and more than what, what you need. So they were to eat the lamb with the shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand. What are you doing? We're going somewhere. Where are you going? We're going to follow God into a land that he has promised. Christian, what are you doing? I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. What's a pilgrim? If somebody's walking to some place he's not, he hasn't got to yet. I'm a pilgrim. What am I doing? I'm walking on. I'm on my pilgrimage, right? What are you doing, Christian? The Passover is nigh. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Glory to God. Pharaoh, everybody in from the cow barn all the way to the palace is going to lose their firstborn. But not in, not in Israel. I will pass over you. The lamb. The lamb is going to shed his life, his blood. That you might stand there with the blood on your door. And with the flesh in your hand. Consuming it with your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. And ready to go. And all the jewels of Egypt, because God blessed Israel and said, go out and borrow everything you can from them, money, jewels, whatever. And by the way, that's what God used to adorn the, the tabernacle with. And it was God's money because the, it, the Egyptians had used the Israelites as slaves and hadn't paid them. So God said, y'all going to pay up. So he made Egypt pay up what they owed the Israelites. And they went out with sacks full of gold and earrings and jewels and all of that and and they're, they're going with God into a place that they never had seen before and that's where I am that's where you are whom having not seen we love going into a place eye hath not seen ear hath not heard neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him Oh, glory to God, dear soul. It is beyond understanding. And yet the thing that we know will get us there is that which sustains us here, and that is the presence of our blessed Lamb that we feast off of and that we constantly eat. Amen. We don't eat it with leaven. Pride is not allowed. Pride goes before a what? fall. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Talking about the pride of the Pharisees. We eat it with bitter herbs. The brother told us faithfully this morning, you must, through much tribulation, 
enter the kingdom of God. Sometimes with tears, hot tears on our cheeks falling down, we, 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 we follow God, love the Lord, and we, we are hurting, and it, it is not always easy. Sometimes it's the most difficult thing in the world to maintain uh, our proper deportment in the Holy Ghost and in obedience. But the bitter herbs uh, cause us to understand these are not the rare delicacies of uh, the king, four and 20 blackbirds baked within a pie. I don't want no live birds put inside my pie. I'd rather have apples, you know, apple cobbler or something. But anyhow, they were trying to sh please the king and come up with all kind of stuff. I wonder how them birds felt when they stuck them in the oven. Anyhow, I've always wondered about that. Uh, it, 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 it's not the delicacies uh, in, in Herod's court, their soul, but feeding you with necessary food. Oh, thank God. And so now as a living appetite cast upon the body to get the nourishment from whence I was drawn like the babe cast upon his mother's breast after he's born, we are cast upon Christ and like Noah's bird that flew out from the ark, couldn't find a place to land, come back to the ark, we find that Christ is both the source, dear soul, and it's the object of our faith and our love. We come back to him. There's no other place for us to light our foot. You will never find anything to satisfy you like the Lord Jesus Christ once you get saved. Amen. So the Lord comes saying in John chapter 6, and you know this, verse number 26 and 27 Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And then he begins to talk in verse number 48, and he says, I am the bread of life, and it goes on down. As your fathers eat manna in the wilderness, they're dead. But you eat this manner, eat this which cometh down from heaven, you shall never die. So there's a difference between that which Herod was eating to satisfy not only his natural hunger, but he went beyond that into extravagance for it to titillate and excite and to overindulge. And you see what it got him into. Then in John 6, while we're still here, the third meal, the natural meal that he gave them. John 6 and verse number 9, there is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small, please notice this word, two small, what's the next word in John 6 and verse 9? Five barley loaves and two small fishes. You say, well, that's just the English word fishes, but it's not the same Greek word used in the other Gospels. Barley loaves, poor man's bread. Two small fishes. This word, and you need to listen because you're not going to believe it. There's two Strong's Concordance is back there in the back. You can look it up before you leave church and face me with it and say I'm wrong or I'm right. This word fishes speaks of, quote, a relish. It's not like I relish your whatever. It's relish. Like you put on, you say, I got some hot pepper relish. That's what I'm talking about. A relish to other foods as a cooked sauce, dried and salted as a condiment. The Sea of Galilee was full of these little old fingerlings, little old fish. The poor people used it and they'd cook these in, in a saucepan and they'd take the sauce and dry it 
and salt it and use it to sprinkle on their other food to give it good taste. This wasn't really even a meal. It was just, what does it say, the last three words there in John 6, 9, the last three that we read. And two small fishes. Different Greek word. And so the question naturally is, but what are they among so many? So we see this all that this is what Jesus used in order to get them to understand that it's not the big stuff. It's just the barley loaves. It's the poor man's bread. For wouldn't he go along with that instead of with Herod's baker and Herod's uh, uh, dessert maker and all of that, Herod's cooks, when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's just barley bread, but that which goes with barley bread is not two big old slabs of fine fish. It's just two little fingerling fishes that usually, instead of taking them for your lunch, you use it to make a sauce out of and use it as a condiment on other foods. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus is going to bring this back to them. Mark chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 15. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. That's just a side thing. Don't have anything to do with anything till they make it have to do with something. And he just says, he charged them saying, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they said, oh, he's just fussing us because we forgot the bread. That's not what he was talking about. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. Now listen. And when Jesus heard, knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because we have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand? Have, you, have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? Do ye not remember? Listen at verse 19. You want to read it? Read it out loud to me. Mark 8, 19. The loaves and the fishes were the subject of Christ's rebuke to them for not remembering to listen to him with a spiritual ear. Don't you have ears to hear? Have you hardened your hearts that much more? He brings them back to this miracle. He brings them back to understand that I didn't feed 5,000 people with that little poor lad's lunch, you know, uh, just for the show of it. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Herod's leftovers. We didn't wait outside at the kitchen door and say, how much food did Herod have left over? Let's take some of this rich food. No, it was barley loaves and two little fingerlings that are usually not eaten. They're used to make a sauce and dry and salted to make a relish to make other foods taste good. But even with that, no more than that, how many basketfuls did we have left? He said 12. And when the seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said seven. Now listen. And he said unto them, how is it that you have, that you do not have understanding? This miracle was not simply a physical ordeal. It was a revelation 
of the meal that Jesus Christ provides for souls. It is in a desolate place, a deserted place. It is a place where there are no sources for food. You can't buy groceries in order to prepare food. If you did, there's no ovens out there to fix it with. It, it is, it is, it, there, there's no food to prepare. And dear soul, there is nothing that can be done except being cast upon the bread of heaven himself. This is what he wanted his people to understand and he rebuked them for not having eyes to see and ears to hear and for their hearts being hardened and them thinking that all he was talking about when he said beware the leaven of the Pharisees they didn't get the spiritual message they said he's fussing us because we forgot the bread Never, not even close to what the Lord was talking about and he reminded them of these two little fishes isn't that amazing now look at John 21 you remember I told you that the word two small fishes was a different <coughs> word in the Greek than we find anywhere else. Here it comes again, the same Greek word. John 21, verse 1. After these things... Jesus showed himself, I am meek and lowly. Take my yoke. Jesus showed himself. He's manifesting his character. He's telling them and revealing them himself. Not just miracles, but himself. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. On this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said, I go a fishing. I quit. I'm through. Jesus is dead and it's all over with. I wish it worked out, but it didn't. I'm going back to the fishing business. They say unto, the, unto him, Makes sense to us. We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Serves them right. And when the morning was now come, when the light comes, Jesus appears. Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. If you're going to quit on God, he ain't going to get in the boat with you. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fish's coat on him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes. So far, you haven't seen the same word, little fish, as we saw over there in Mark, excuse me, John 6 and verse 9. But here it comes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and here is the same Greek word as small fishes in John 6, 9. And they saw a, fi a, a fire of coals there, and them little fingerling fishes laid their own and bread. Now, I can't prove it, but I bet you a nickel it was barley bread. Jesus said unto them, and he uses this word, bring of the fingerling tiny little fishes that you make relish out of, which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, not the same Greek word. 
and hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples dared ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them. And guess which word this is? Little tiny fingerling fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself. Where have we seen that phrase? Verse 1 after these things, Jesus is going to show his character to them. This is how the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Jesus said, Peter, you can be associated with great fishes. Verse number 11. But to show myself to you, as I did back there in the deserted place, I'm going to show myself to you as poor man's bread and little small fingerling fishes. That's what I've got on the fire. I'm going to reveal my character to you and manifest myself to you because you can't say that this is eternal life except you know him. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm, like that. Sounds like leisure. Laying there in the shade, you know, just having a big time. No. Because the next verse says, take my yoke. Wait a minute. That's talk about work. Rest to your souls doesn't negate working with God. Adam wasn't put to work in the garden as punishment. It was a privilege. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me and you shall find rest unto your souls. It's always best to be called into a desert place, a deserted place, a place in the wilderness prepared by God. It would be better to have uh, a dinner of herbs in, in, the in the tents of the righteous than to eat the, the, the stalled ox with, with the wicked. I'd rather, I'd rather have fingerling fish. Other people don't take any trouble with them. They just boil and make relish out of them because they're only good for making other food taste good. That's what Jesus fed them. That was the lad that he ordained to be there. A poor lad. He wasn't dressed in blue velvet and had fancy clothes on. He was just a little lad. Just a little old city boy. A little country boy. Just a little lad of a boy with barley bread and two fingerling fishes. That's all God needed. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if there's a if there's a lad here, I wonder if there's a lass here that don't have much, but they got a little barley loaf and two little fingerling fishes that Jesus can use. I wonder if there's a child here. No matter what your age or whether you are a parent or just a child. I wonder if there's a child of God here that's got something that's in their hand and they turn it over to God. And God would even down the line say, listen, you knucklehead disciples, I ain't talking about you forgetting bread. I'm talking about the leaven of pride. And I want you to understand, what did I do when we didn't have anything but those little bitty fishes? How many basketfuls did I take up? Did y'all take up 12? Then remember that. And then the last time, the third time that he reveals himself, and the last time we see the Lord manifesting himself to his disciples, 
Peter has the great fish, but Jesus has the little fingerlings to bring them back down to understand. I am meek and lowly of heart. You need to understand. You're not so insignificant in yourself that I can't use you for my glory because I use barley bread and I use little fingerling fish and I launched the, the evangelism of the entire world with these apostles with little fingerling fish on the fire and I, I assume barley bread. And by the way, those basketfuls, if you'll read it, those baskets, they're so, it says that they were made by willow twigs. That was what poor people used to make baskets with. Everything about this is trying to get us away from the leaven of the Pharisees from the high-mindedness of Herod, from trying to gorge in, uh, ourselves with extravagance and to be meek and lowly like the Lord was because it says twice here, this is how Jesus showed himself to them. Do you know him? Is there an awareness of God in your life? D do you... Are, are, are you acquainted w with him? How do you find him to be? He is meek and lowly of heart. He is, he, he is that one that, it, that it is, does not blow the trumpet in the streets or call attention to himself. Oh, my soul. The Bible says, Come to Bethel, Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply your trans. Go to these high, muckety-muck religious places and transgress. And bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Go ahead and put your pride in it, leaven. And proclaim and publish the free offerings, for this liketh you. You like this, don't you? Oh, you children of Israel, saith the Lord. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and a lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Amos 4, verses 4 through 6. Brother Gene, how can I get that bread? The Bible said, come to me and buy bread without price and wine without price. God has a bountiful supply, but you're going to have to learn to eat with a meek and lowly one and come into his presence with a humility that's due the respect unto him. There's the three meals.